The 16th and 17th centuries were the formative 200 years leading to the creation of the United States of America. They started with Spanish conquistadors exploring the southeastern United States and ended with 12 English colonies firmly in place along the Atlantic seaboard, in place with well-established ideals of self-governance, democracy, and religious tolerance. Today, the United States is an economic powerhouse, a corporate-based economic powerhouse. That heritage can be traced back to the first permanent English settlement in North America, Jamestown Colony. By the end of the 16th century, the outlook for English colonization in North America was bleak. Her first efforts at settlement failed when Sir Walter Raleigh's Royan Oak Colony vanished into thin air in 1590. Indeed, England was on the brink of being shut out of North America altogether, when a daring and innovative business idea, hatched by London merchants, changed the course of history. In 1606, these merchants formed a joint stock company in order to spread the financial risk in a colonizing venture to Virginia. Calling themselves the Virginia Company of London, the merchants profited or lost according to the amounts of shares they owned. By spreading the risk, they could invest without having to gamble their entire fortunes. So brilliant was this novel scheme that it would set the stage for English colonization in North America and ultimately become the basis of American life, commerce, and even government. In December 1606, the London Company sent 100 settlers, all men, on ships like these to make the hazardous journey to the New World. The following May, these colonists sailed up the James River and established Jamestown. The plan was to build a settlement and at the same time, look for a route to the Pacific Ocean and to prospect for gold. From the beginning, the new colony was beset by problems. The heavily forested land was swampy and a haven for malaria-carrying mosquitoes. The colonists neglected the necessary tasks of planting, plowing, and building to make a successful colony. Instead, they spent their efforts searching for gold. Jamestown was on the brink of disaster and the joint stock company was about to fail when two young men turned the London company's fortunes around. They were planter John Rolfe and Captain John Smith. By 1608, the 27-year-old Smith took over command of the Virginia colony. Born in 1580, he was a soldier who had fought the Ottoman Turks in Hungary. He mapped the area and overawed the Indians obtaining from them food that kept the settlers from starving. He ended the mad scramble for gold, forcing the men to build fortifications and plant Indian corn. John Smith's efforts saved the settlement, and over the next six years, it gradually spread up the shores of the James River. Though the colony was beginning to prosper, and life, though difficult, was becoming more normal, the colony remained on the verge of economic failure for its London investors. There was no money-making trade to send back home. Then in 1612, John Rolfe found a way to make a profit. He knew that a product grown in the New World was sweeping through Europe, creating smoke shops. It was tobacco. By adapting a Caribbean island strain of tobacco to Virginia's climate, he produced a profit. As a result, the Virginia Company was able to shore up its investment and embark on a new round of immigration to the colony. 
the joint stock company became the model for English colonization, ultimately leading to control of the North American continent and to the founding of the United States of America. In short, the Virginia Company's incredible economic success story would define one half of the American character in the same way that colonial growth toward self-government would define the other half. The colonists' journey was arduous, the days long and grueling, through a sun-drenched, dry and barren desert, through lands occupied by Indian tribes who viewed travelers with suspicion, to a destination they could not be certain would support them and their families. And yet, these brave Hispanic men and women would succeed, succeed against famine, drought, and Indian raids to found a thriving settlement. That settlement would grow to become a jewel in Spain's imperial crown, Santa Fe. Today, visitors easily travel through New Mexico's magnificent scenery. It is the region of breathtaking landscapes and remnants of ancient cultures. And it is still home to Native American Pueblos. But 400 years ago, it was a wild and untamed land that the first Hispanic colonists encountered. There was no guarantee they would succeed. In 1540, Francisco Coronado went through northern New Mexico looking for the golden city of legend, Cibola. Though he never found any gold, Coronado repeated tales of wealth that were to be found in northern New Mexico. Then 55 years later, in 1595, Spain's King Philip II commissioned a Mexican silver mine owner, Juan de Oñate, to colonize New Mexico and spread Catholicism among the Native Americans. He also named Oñate governor of the colony. Three years later, Oñate, an explorer warrior in the mold of Cortez and Coronado, led a group of 500 soldiers, colonists, and Franciscan friars along with 7,000 head of cattle north from Zacatecas in central Mexico across the Rio Grande River to New Mexico. By July 1598, the colonists established the first capital of New Mexico at San Gabriel Pueblo in the northern Rio Grande Valley and immediately began building missions to convert the Indians. Like the English colonists at Jamestown, which followed nine years later in 1607, Uñate's expedition was split into two factions. Historian James E. Ivey described the first faction as entrepreneurs who hoped to make a profit trading with the Indians and prospecting for gold. The other faction consisted of true colonists who hoped to set up ranches and farms and start a thriving settlement. Conditions at first were harsh. Cold weather and short food supplies made survival difficult. As governor, Juan de Oñate's military leadership was overbearing. As a result, the settlers' faction broke from the group and petitioned to establish a new capital away from the San Gabriel Pueblo. The leadership of the settlers is shrouded in mystery. Most likely, he was a Castilian-born adventurer, Juan Martinez de Montoya, a man described as tall, of good feature, black-bearded. He served as a captain under Añate and was named Alcalde, or Mayor of San Gabriel. The surviving records of the time report that early in 1608, he founded a settlement at Santa Fe called Plaza de Santa Fe. That same year, a new governor was appointed for New Mexico and Juan de Añate was ordered home. The new governor, Don Pedro de Peralta, was ordered to establish Montoya's Santa Fe settlement as the capital of New Mexico. Sometime in 1609, the new capital was named La Villa Real de la Santa Fe, or the Royal City of the Holy Faith. With its founding, the survival of the New Mexico colony was assured. 
Santa Fe went on to prosper and become a leading city in Spain's northern provinces. But friction between the Hispanics and Pueblo Indians continued to increase. In 1680, the Pueblos, led by a charismatic chief, Pope, attacked the Spanish settlers and missionaries. Over 400 were killed. The survivors fled south to present-day El Paso, Texas, where they founded new settlements and missions. Hispanic control was not regained until 1692, when the New Mexican governor, Diego de Vargas, recaptured Santa Fe. By the time the Santa Fe Trail opened in 1821, the city had indeed fulfilled the dream of those early colonists, a flourishing model of Hispanic business, trading and ranching enterprises. The name most Americans remember her by is Pocahontas. It was a nickname meaning the naughty one or spoiled one. Her real name was Matuaka. She was the daughter of Powhatan, leader of the powerful Powhatan Confederacy of Indian Nations. Yet, just as important, she was a Renaissance woman. A woman who saw that working with the English colonists might improve life for her people. At the time of the arrival of the English at Jamestown in 1607, a chief known as Powhatan ruled a nation covering one-fifth of present-day Virginia and part of North Carolina. His chiefdom was part of a political renaissance among American Indian nations of the eastern woodlands. A renaissance that saw the emergence of coalitions such as the Powhatan Confederacy. Leagues of friendship, such as the Iroquois League. And alliances based on a common language and interests, like the Algonquin Confederacy. The English landing at Jamestown troubled Pocahontas' father, Powhatan, and his followers, many of whom recalled violent encounters with Spanish conquistadors. Tensions between the English newcomers and the Indians quickly grew toward war. The English wanted the Indians to work for them, growing and harvesting corn. Powhatan and others saw the English as invaders who must be stopped. Tensions came to a head when Captain John Smith, a leader of the Jamestown colony, was captured. Legend has it that Powhatan decided to kill the strange white man and send a message to the English. According to Smith, he was dragged before the chief, his head laid upon a rock. At that moment, Pocahontas risked her life to stop the execution. Whether or not the legend is true, Pocahontas' actions initiated a change in the point of view of her father. Clearly in the years that followed, Pocahontas became a true Renaissance figure. She single-handedly pushed for cooperation between the whites and the Indians. A cooperation that would lead to the success of Jamestown, and from there, ultimately, to the making of the United States of America. Pocahontas would go on to be baptized as a Christian and take on the English name, Rebecca. She married John Rolfe, a leading figure of the Jamestown colony. Their marriage would bring a period of peace between the colonists and the Powhatan Confederacy. The period lasted only eight years, but it was enough time for the faltering colony to become firmly established through the growing of tobacco. In the spring of 1616, Rolfe took Pocahontas to England. There she was feted as an Indian princess, met King James I, and bore Ralphie a son. In March of 1617, at the age of 21, Pocahontas became ill and died before she could return to her homeland. She was buried in England. In her short life, Pocahontas was a remarkable Renaissance woman 
who showed friendship to the white settlers. In the 21st century, New York City is a teeming metropolis of more than 8 million people. It is home to numerous art galleries, museums, theaters, and it is the world's commercial and financial center. 400 years ago, it began as a dream in the eye of the Dutch West India Company. In 1609, Henry Hudson, an English navigator working for the Netherlands, sailed on his ship, the Half Moon, up the Hudson River, looking for a route to Asia. What he found instead was a remarkably fertile river valley, rich with furs and having a natural harbor at its mouth into the Atlantic. Five years later, Dutch explorer Andrian Bloch's map of North America claimed present-day New York as New Netherlands for the Netherlands. But a claim for territory also required settlement. So in May of 1624, the Dutch West India Company landed 30 families on modern-day Governor's Island. More families followed, and the following year, Fort Amsterdam was built on Manhattan Island. The year after that, according to tradition, the colony's director general, Peter Minuet, purchased Manhattan Island from the Lenape Indians for $24 in trade goods. In 1636, Minuet would go on to found North America's first Swedish colony at present-day Wilmington, Delaware. Indeed, with the French to the northwest, the English to the north and south, and the Spanish in Florida, what was to become the United States of America was already a melting pot of different cultures. From the start, New Netherlands was conceived as a utopian colony, where people were free to practice their religion and live by their consciences. Indeed, this would lead to the government of New Netherlands granting full citizenship to Jewish settlers in 1655. The Dutch held on to New Netherlands for 40 years, then in 1664, Charles II of England sent four English frigates into New Amsterdam's harbor and demanded New Netherlands surrender. The Dutch Director General Peter Stuyvesant negotiated good terms, managing to preserve the utopian aspect of the Dutch governing principles, which assured New Netherlanders that they shall keep and enjoy the liberty of their consciences and religion. Ultimately, these early Dutch codes would become a part of the American fabric of diversity and liberty. Charles II gave New Netherlands to his brother James, the Duke of York, to rule. In 1675, the name was changed to New York. In 1607, men, Englishmen, boarded ships like these. They were bound for the New World, the Mid-Atlantic coast. A hundred years later, at the beginning of the 18th century, their numbers would grow to over 250,000 spread out over 12 colonies. During that span of time, these forerunners of the United States would learn how to survive in a hostile and foreign environment, create many experiments in representative government, build a legal system, and fight wars. They would also show great religious tolerance and great religious intolerance, show intense loyalty to the English monarchy, and engage in treasonous behavior. In these first 100 years, the foundation for the grand adventure in self-government would be laid by those who rode the seas to places like Plymouth Plantation and Jamestown. The first permanent English settlement in America was Jamestown. It was a business venture of the Virginia Company. But unlike the Spanish and Portuguese explorers to the south and the French to the north, 
The Virginia colonists found no wealth in gold or furs. But this lack of easy wealth was a blessing, forcing the colonists by their own enterprise to create that wealth through independent commerce and industry. Who were these early business adventurers? They were drawn from every class, noblemen and younger aristocratic sons who had few chances for land and power in England. Investors and merchants, middle-class sons who wanted a new start. And then there were the poor who came as indentured servants. Life for these settlers was a struggle. Many died from disease and starvation. In fact, Jamestown was on the brink of failure when in 1614, John Rolfe sent the first shipment of tobacco to England, marking the beginning of a lucrative industry. In that same year, private ownership of land was instituted for the settlers. Private land ownership would become the cornerstone of American democracy. Indeed, for many years, land ownership determined who had the right to govern. In 1619, now on their way to establishing a flourishing tobacco industry, Virginia planters held the first legislative assembly in the New World. Called the House of Burgesses, its members passed their first laws that same year. It marked the beginning of democratic representative government. In the years that followed, Virginia would become a leader for independence and democracy in the colonies. It was from the House of Burgesses that Patrick Henry delivered his famous speech that included his immortal phrase for freedom, give me liberty or give me death. The greatest difference between the immigrants from England and those from other European countries was in the religious diversity of its settlers. This religious diversity included Quakers, Catholics, and many denominations of Protestants. But the most significant of these were the Puritans. In 1620, they arrived on the Mayflower at Plymouth Plantation, which later became known as Massachusetts Bay Colony. The beliefs and practices of the Puritans profoundly shaped what would become the American character and were the wellspring of American ideals, liberty, human rights, self-government, education, and intellectual thought. As nonconformists, the Massachusetts Puritans were constantly at odds with the monarchy. In the 17th century, Massachusetts Bay routinely ignored dictums from London. Indeed, Massachusetts became the early hotbed of revolution as America moved further toward self-government. However, Puritanism had its extremist dark side. Puritans were religious bigots who murdered Quakers and burned witches at Salem, Massachusetts in 1692. But in a curious way, the Puritans' religious persecution fostered religious tolerance in other colonies such as Rhode Island, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. In fact, this religious turmoil and diversity of early colonial America produced the two most important pieces of American democracy, the separation of church and state, and freedom of speech and expression of ideas. Ignored by London, the colonists quickly developed ideas of self-government. It was in Maryland, one of the religiously tolerant colonies, that a prototype of the U.S. Constitution emerged in 1635. Under the terms of its charter, its proprietor, Lord Baltimore, was required to gain the assent of the colony's freemen to any legislation. In the 17th century, a freeman was any male who could vote for representatives to a legislative assembly. At the same time, there emerged throughout the colonies the phenomenon of town meetings that dealt with local interests and needs. Citizens gathered to decide on matters of taxes, education, public law and charity, and eventually, revolution. In 1638, colonial leader Thomas Hooker opened a town meeting in Connecticut with these prophetic words. The foundation of authority is laid in the free consent of the people. His belief that all men should have a voice and a vote were in treasonous opposition to monarchy rule. In 1669, the proprietors of the Carolina colonies issued the Fundamental Constitution. Written by John Locke, it laid out a blueprint for government. 118 years later, 
the United States of America adopted a permanent blueprint for government with the writing of the Constitution. Carolina's fundamental constitution was followed in 1680 with William Penn's famous form of government, another blueprint, this time stressing limitations on the process of governing. By the beginning of the 18th century, all the English colonies had some form of representative government, a newfound religious tolerance, and institutions of education which produced an intelligentsia that understood the basis of English law, liberty, and property, first expressed in the Magna Carta in 1215 and later clarified in the English Bill of Rights in 1689. What was equally remarkable in these first 100 years is what did not happen. Left largely to themselves by England, the colonies did not become a theocracy, nor were they ruled by dictators or despots, nor did they become colonial fiefdoms granted by English kings. As the 18th century dawned, the benign neglect of the American colonies would come to an end. The English Parliament was determined to take a more active role in governing, but it was too late. Something new for mankind had started, and it could not be stopped. It was a new kind of self-rule by the people, of the people, and for the people. Hi. I'm Bill Ambrose. If you like this video, subscribe so we can bring you more programming from our studio. Thank you for subscribing.